Foundation. We began a partnership with Beth Curran, who you see here four years ago, and I can confidently share that our talented faculty and your curious children thrive in a math setting as a result. Beth has had a career in education with a focus on mathematics and then in Singapore math in particular, and I'm sure she'll share a little bit more. Uh, we welcome you again, and also big welcome to Beth, who we haven't seen in person in a bit. That's been a year. Uh, I know. And a few notes, um, we are recording, so we are recording the um, um, events, so then that way we can share with any um, parents who are um, unable to attend. I will be posting into the chat um, a link to a Google Doc um, from Beth, which is a handy visual reference for this evening. Um, a couple more things, a uh, uh, friendly request to keep any mics off while the presentation is happening so we can all hear. Feel free to pose questions in the chat. Um, we will respond during the presentation or during Q&A, depending on the question. Um, and thank you for your patience, but we want to be nimble with your questions. Um, and with that, I think I've covered the housekeeping details. Um, it is, once again, it's so good to see you. And um, Beth, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Sally. And thank you for, to all of you for um, taking time out of your very, very busy schedules to join me tonight so that I can share with you something that I am truly passionate about, which is um, making math accessible for all students. And by shifting the way that we teach mathematics um, in the United States in order to um, provide these opportunities for students. So thank you, thank you so much for um, joining. Um, I'll just briefly tell you a little bit about me. Um, I will go ahead and share a presentation here. Uh, let me just get this going here. So um, if you received that link to the document, you should have my information there. Um, if not, um, it's right here on this slide. And I do want to let you know that um, if at any point throughout the presentation, you'd like to take a screen cap of the, um, the slides that you're seeing or take a picture with your cell phone, um, I would you know, highly recommend you, that you do that. If I tend, if I go too fast and I flip ahead to a screen and you'd really like to see what I, um, the previous screen, just um, unmute yourself and let me, you know, let me know, just back up a bit because I want to take a picture of that. I'm happy to do that. So, um, so, you know, if you want to take a screen cap, cap of this, so you have my email address, um, please go ahead and do that. Um, I love getting emails from people with questions about math and how to help their children. So please feel free to do that just to identify yourself so that I can kind of get a little frame of reference as to where you're coming from and where your um, child, that your child is attending La Scuola. Um, and I do also ask that, um, you know, I'm happy to, ha to help you in any way to help you and support your child. Um, if, it's, if it's dealing with an issue that in the classroom, I'm just gonna ask that you please address that with the teacher first before you contact me. Um, but it, that being said, I'm super happy to answer any questions. So um, just a little bit about me and my journey with Singapore math. Um, I um, was a teacher in the classroom. I taught um, kindergarten through fourth grade as a homeroom teacher for about 13 years. Um, the last three of those 13, I um, started specializing in mathematics. So the school that I was at, also an independent school on the East Coast though, um, in Virginia, which is where I, I still live today, um, we had implemented this primary mathematics curriculum. And um, at the time, there was kind of some unrest in the school. You know, some of the teachers weren't happy with the decision. And I was in a position where I was sort of leading the math um, group. And the head of school said, you know, let's go ahead and just um, have four dedicated math teachers to teach at the lower school level. And so I was one of those. And so for the last three years, I just taught math to kindergarten through fourth grade students. I pushed into the classrooms. I led the math lesson with the help of the teacher. So that gave me a wealth of experience across grades. It gave me um, a real depth of understanding with the curriculum. Um, I will tell you that I immediately started noticing differences in um, students' confidence, um, differences in how deeply they understood the math, their problem-solving skills, their perseverance, all these things were, um, 
were just evident right away that by switching the curriculum, it really did affect how um, students perceive themselves as math students. Um, so I spent three years doing that, and then I um, joined a company where um, what I did was professional development for teachers. So I took what I had learned um, and worked so hard at on um, developing my skills myself at the school that I was at, and I, I thought, well, you know what, if I do feel this passionate about it and I believe in this uh, method, then I should be sharing this with teachers across the country. And so I did that for um, four years with another company and then just... A year ago, I started my my own company. So, so I've been working with the Singapore curriculum for oh, almost ten years now, um, and I will tell you that um, I'm still just as passionate about it as I was. In fact, maybe even more than when I first was introduced to it. So, um, so here's our agenda for this evening. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about why Singapore. You know, why Singapore math. Um, we're going to talk about just briefly what we know about how children learn best and how you will see that played out in the curriculum um, that's taught at La Scuola. So we'll talk about how math is taught here and then also um, how you can help at home, how you can support your child. And then we'll leave some time for some questions at the end, okay? So why Singapore? Um, for those of you who um, understand and know anything about Singapore, the big thing, I think the big takeaway is that basically within a generation, they went from being a third world country to having one of the top like three economies in the world. And the way that they did that was, was by recognizing that the need to invest in their citizens. And the best way to invest in their citizens is to invest in the, the education of their citizens. And so, so right around um, the 1980s, they started developing um, national curriculum for reading and writing and also, also mathematics. Um, and then they really honed that, you know, they worked on that. They um, narrowed down the syllabus, so reduced items. They added a lot of problem solving into the syllabus. And then um, when they um, participated in international tests, for, in particular, the trends in math and science study is the one I'm gonna talk about, um, their students rose to the top. So by 1995, their students in fourth grade and eighth grade were scoring in the number one position um, for mathematics. So that was just 15 years of working with their curriculum. They were able to go from really far down below that mid range in this testing up to the number one position. And so that brought them to the world's attention. Now in 1980, when they decided to start developing their own national curriculum, they also decided that they were going to teach in English. So throughout Singapore, if you go into a Singapore school, the curriculum is, the instruction is done in English. It's a, it's, Singapore is quite a melting pot. So lots of different cultures and languages are spoken. So students are always given the opportunity to practice their um, native language, but then also um, they, they learn in English. And so those materials from Singapore were really easy to bring over into the United States because translation wasn't necessary. The only thing that needed to be um, uh, tweaked a little bit were um, the currency and the measurement. So I spoke about this trends in math and science study. So this is um, kind of the international, um, it's, the, the, it's the, the big like indicator of how countries are doing with their math education. Um, it's um, administered every four years. So 2019 was a testing year again, and those um, results were actually just released in December. And so these are the, you know, the newest um, results of the, that most recent test. And so here you can see again, so this, this is, I know there's a lot on this page and it's a little bit busy, but I tried to highlight their um, Singapore scale score and the United States. So you can see where we rank among all these countries that participated in this. Um, and this is for fourth graders. There's also a test that's administered for eighth graders. Singapore's fourth graders and eighth graders, again, ranked in that number one position. And there's um, something interesting there, that top box says East Asian countries are the top achievers in mathematics by a substantial margin. So look at the difference between um, Japan and then the Russian Federation, which is the next one down. And it's a 26 point difference. And if you look at all the others, they're all about one or two points away from each other. So there's a huge gap between how these Eastern Asian countries, um, they're how their students perform on these international tests and everyone else. Um, so why is that? So something that Hong Kong, Korea, 
China, Japan, all have in common in their mathematics um, curriculum is a conceptual understanding um, and super rich in problem solving. And so again, the reason why we talk about Singapore math in the United States is because the translation wasn't necessary. But if you look at um, Japan math, which is now kind of coming into the United States and getting pretty popular because they have been translated, um, you'll see it, the, the approach is exactly the same. The methodologies are the same. Um, and so this is what makes them sort of stand out. Um, I will tell you that um, that scale score for the United States of 535 looks pretty good, but it's actually lower. It's about five points lower than the 2015 scale score. So we've kind of plateaued. Um, our, our students kind of reached a point and then we're just kind of stuck there. And so over the last, you know, probably 10 years, we haven't really made much progress in mathematics. Um, while other countries are kind of moving up and down a little bit. One thing that's consistent though is Singapore has been at the top and every year their students increase that that number one scale score so their score went you know it that 625 is actually higher than it was in 2015 so every year they tend to do better and better and better um, so what's really interesting for me as a curriculum person is not just looking at the scale score but looking at the types of questions that are on this um, test and so they're divided up into four different categories um, and they're called, they call them benchmarks. So there's low level, intermediate, high and advanced. And so I just, I have this document here that kind of describes these, um, each type of the of question here. So a low level question means that a student can add, subtract, multiply and divide one and two digit whole numbers. They can solve simple word problems. So it's your basic computation. So if you look at Is that better? Sorry. <laughs> so if you look at a, a low level question here, you can see that. So these are um, percentages of students who can answer these types of questions. So a um, low level type of question, again, is your basic computation. So what we can see is that Singapore and the United States, we're, we're doing pretty well, right? A good number of our students can answer low level types of questions. Something that's interesting, though, to look at and note from this chart is that as the questions get harder, that gap between the number of students in the US who can answer these and then the percentage of students in the in Singapore who can answer these types of questions, the gap gets wider and wider. So an intermediate type of question, this means that they can compute three and four digit whole numbers in a variety of situations, and they have some understanding of decimals and fractions. So then at the high um, level questions, they can apply conceptual understanding of whole numbers to solve two-step word problems. They show understanding of the number line, multiples, factors, and rounding numbers and operations with fractions and decimals. And then the advanced level types of questions is now students are involved in solving complex problems, complex situations that require multiple steps. Um, involving whole numbers and they're able to show their their understanding of fractions and decimals. So the big difference between like a high level type of question and advanced is that the advanced types of questions tend to be unfamiliar. So these are like real world problems because the problems that we face out in the in the work field are not um, scripted. They're they're always unusual and always different. And so so uh, what our goal is, is to get students to the point where they can have such a deep understanding of the mathematics that even when they're posed with a problem that's outside of something they've ever seen before, they have the tools to be able to solve that. And so, so that's what we're, we're um, striving toward is getting our students to that point. And so, so just looking at this, what we can say just from a curriculum standpoint is that Traditional mathematics education in the United States does a really good job of teaching students to calculate, but not to solve problems. And again, that's what mathematics is all about. It's really about solving problems. Okay, so let's take a look at a few um, examples of these types of questions. So a low level type of question, um, three plus eight equals blank plus six, right? Multiple choice problem. Um, 
So what we want students to understand is that that equal sign has value, that whatever's on one side is the other. What a lot of students, a mistake they might make is three plus eight equals, and the answer goes in that next space. So they might put 11 plus six, not understanding the, the power of that equal sign. But what we want is for students to see that if 11's on one side, what do we need to make, what do we need to add to six to get 11 on the other side of that equal sign? Um, 85% of students in Singapore on the 2011 TIMS. Now I know that this was quite a while ago, but um, they're they're kind of um, tight about <laughs> releasing questions and percentages. Um, but only 47% of students in the United States can answer a, could could answer a question like this, um, and that should make you feel a little bit, you know, shocked. Honestly, that we we think that our fourth graders should be able to to, to um, access problems like this at a much higher percentage. So here's kind of an, here's an intermediate level fourth grade question. Tom ate half of the cake and Jane ate fourth of the cake. How much cake did they eat all together? Now, I wanna point out to you this um, student response over here. So here's a student that um, the top one got the correct response, but, but look at this right here. Does anyone remember learning like this butterfly method? Well, the student confused, you know, knew that there was this thing that you could do where you cross multiply, but wasn't sure when to apply it. So when we teach procedures without teaching understanding, students can get confused and not know when to apply those. With um, a Singapore curriculum, we always focus on developing a visual understanding of the problems and the math concepts. And so in this case, what we want is for students to have a visual that, you know, here's a whole cake. And you'll see these in, you know, in bar modeling. So here's a whole cake. Tom ate half of it. So we could divide that cake in half pretty easily. Jane ate one fourth of the same cake. So now we've got it. We have to divide this into four equal parts so that we can show that Jane ate one fourth. So now we can easily see without doing any calculating, we can see that all together they ate three of those one fourth pieces. So three fourths would be the answer. Now, once students have that visual, then we help them connect that to the abstract. So that's, um, that's how lessons tend to flow in a Singapore curriculum. Okay, um, only 35% of students in the United States in fourth grade on the, that 2011 could answer this as compared to 84% in Singapore. And then this is um, an example of a high level question. Duncan first traveled four and eight tenths kilometers in a car then he traveled one and five tenths kilometers in a bus. How far did Duncan travel? Now, this is a basic addition problem. What makes it high level is now we've brought, we've brought in some decimals into this. So I will tell you that of those four choices, the most frequent incorrect or most common incorrect answer in the United States is C. So what that tells us is that we need to focus more on place value and teaching place value. If students understand place value, then decimals just come along naturally. And again, this is 92% um, for Singapore and a 74% are for the United States. So we want students to be able to visualize again when we're solving problems. So here's how far Duncan traveled in total. We know that four and eight tenths of that was what he traveled in the car and one and five tenths was how far he traveled in the bus. And so then we just need to put those two together, okay? So Singapore has been, their curriculum has been so successful basically because they take these five different um, components of their curriculum and they put them all together. So typically um, US curriculum focuses a lot on developing student skills. Um, and we also talk a lot about solving problems, although in a typical cur curriculum, the word problems are always a separate unit and they tend to be kind of at the end of the year. Um, so they're not necessarily incorporated into learning. Um, the conceptual part is what tends to be missing is we tell students how to do the math, but we don't tell them why, we don't explain it to them. Um, with Singapore, um, with the primary mathematics curriculum, you'll see that um, concepts are introduced. So we do teach the skills. They're taught with, with um, a depth of understanding so that conceptual piece um, is strengthened. And then concepts are immediately applied to problem solving. So all of those kind of are tied together and ongoing. And you'll see right here in the middle, 
mathematical problem solving is at the heart of that pentagon there. Now we've got metacognition up here. So we focus on metacognition by asking students to explain their thinking. So what we really want is for students to understand what goes on in their head as they're solving a problem. So, you know, you may have had your own child say to you, um, well, I know the answer 17 and you say, well, how do you know? And they say, well, it just popped in my head. You know, that, that happens quite often. Um, and so what we want is for students to really be able to think through what went on in their head as they were solving that problem, because that will allow them then to generalize or apply that to other situations. Attitudes is another big part. And I wanna show you this little iceberg here. Um, what we tend to see is just the top of the iceberg, right? But what goes on at school and at home is everything underneath, that persistence, that perseverance um, that we're um, trying to teach students, you know, that, yeah, you know what, it's okay to fail and to try again and to persevere through something. Um, disappointment when maybe you don't get something the first time and working hard and dedication. So that's all of the pedagogy that goes along with this curriculum. So this is what's happening and going on in the classrooms all the time. Okay, so when Singapore developed their curriculum um, back in the 1980s and then kind of fine tuned it up until about 1995, they didn't reinvent the wheel. What they did was they looked for best um, practices in education from psychologists and theorists from around the world. And they took that and they put it into action. They also looked at best practices for teaching other content areas. So teaching reading, for example. So what we know um, about how students learn best with reading is that, you know, babies discover their world. They're putting objects in their mouth, they're tasting, they're feeling, they're learning language because this child is, you know, tasting an apple, putting it in their mouth, feeling it. And the, all the while you're saying apple, apple, apple. So they start to recognize that this thing that's sweet and juicy and crunchy that I can put in my mouth is called an apple. So that then when they see it in picture form, they can look at that and say, oh, that's an apple. And I know what it tastes like and what it feels like because I've touched and I've felt it before. And so they can understand that. They can, if you said to the child, um, would you like an apple? They can picture that apple in their head because they've had that time to touch and feel and, ex and explore it. Then we teach them A-P-P-L-E. That means apple. And again, it goes back to that picture, that visual, and then it goes, it relates all the way back to being able to touch and feel that. But with math, we tend to wanna to just start here with students. And so what we know is that students learn best by feeling and exploring and um, engaging in their world. And so what we need to do is start concretely. So the concrete pictorial abstract progression is a hallmark of a Singapore style curriculum. So students will be asked to build models of math. So instead of starting with three plus five, they should be building three beads, three um, red beads, five blue beads, pushing them together and counting. And then they'll draw a picture of that. It might be a bar model. It might be, um, maybe they're drawing cherries and blueberries, um, but they then draw that. That pictorial piece is um, really important because that's what's getting that hands-on concrete into that visual understanding in your head. For example, if I said to you guys right now, everybody grab a piece of paper and draw a tree right? You're picturing a tree in your head because you have had a chance to touch those trees, feel those trees, see those trees out in real life. But if I mentioned some object that you had never seen before, it would be very challenging for you to draw a picture of it. Um, and so we want students to go through that concrete pictorial abstract progression. Now, students will bounce around between these phases. Um, so you might see that, you know, your, your child doesn't need the concrete pieces anymore. They've kind of got the abstract. And then two days later, they seem totally confused. So the, what that means is that they need to go back to the concrete. They need to explore that math hands-on a little bit more to really develop that conceptual understanding. So if you're helping your child at home and they're struggling, um, I encourage you to try to make that math more concrete again. And I'll give you some examples of that as we go through tonight. Okay. So, um, we also want students deriving meaning. So we don't want to give them um, uh, butterfly methods or we don't want to tell them procedures without first having them understand that or just giving them a formula. For example, saying, okay, we're working on area. 
Areas length times width. Okay, let's just go, let's do it. Just plug in those numbers. We want them to derive that formula on their own because then it's gonna have meaning to them. They'll have that visual, they'll have that deeper understanding. So we're gonna start concretely. We'll give students um, square tiles. We'll have them build a rectangle with those square tiles. And then they'll start recognizing that they don't have to count all the square tiles. They can see that it kind of looks like a multiplication array. So we could just multiply four times five. And I know there's 20 there. I don't have to count them every time. And so then we go to a more uh, abstract picture. So now we see a rectangle that's four units on one side, five units on the other. They can picture all those square tiles because they've built it. And now they can find the area just by multiplying those. Then out of that, we say, okay, so how do we find area? We multiply the length times the width. And so as we move to this, we allow students to um, derive that meaning or derive that formula on their own. Okay, so making uh, the math hands on at home. So again, you wanna support your child, they're working through something, maybe they're um, not super clear or seeming confused, then pull out some manipulatives, that give them the opportunity to be able to build that math. So having a coin jar, great. Those are great manipulatives. They can just use them as a counter, buttons, um, a rock collection, whatever you might have around the house. Um, for place value, Skittles, M&Ms, anything that's colored, um, Fruit Loops would be great. Um, there's an example of some different pasta shapes, um, bingo chips. Any of these will help students with place value. So you'll see this, um, you'll see these place value manipulatives being used a lot. Um, in school and also in the workbooks and the um, textbooks that you might see at home. Um, for problem solving, gosh, my, my favorite manipulatives for you guys to have on hand are just um, pieces, strips of paper. These are great hands-on bar models, just cut apart some, um, you know, the old uh, junk mail pile, just cut them apart, let them be um, concrete bar models. Post-it notes, square post-it notes, super helpful when, when you get to, um, equal sized units um, and any sort of cubes and things that you might have around. Okay, so I also have on here these Didax virtual manipulatives. So I do want to um, show you all just what, what that looks like. So let me just flip screens here. Okay, you guys can still see this, right? Okay, so this is a site, I did put the link on that um, resource or that um, document that Sally shared with you, but um, I just wanna show you that this is out there, it's free. So you don't have to buy these manipulatives, you could also use these virtual ones. So if you're looking to help your child with, um, say understanding some of the mental math, here's one with a 10 frame, and then you just, you can click and drop these right in there. So these are super helpful, um, again, to help make that math more visual, more, um, you know, these are virtual manipulatives, so they're not real hands-on, but your child can manipulate them. Um, here's another one that I wanted to share. This one's kind of fun. Um, dice. So again, just to kind of make it a little bit more fun. Um, here we need some dice to play a game at home. So these virtual manip manipulatives are out there, and I just wanted to make, uh, let you guys know about that. Okay, let me flip back to my other screen here. Okay, so having manipulatives are going, going to be helpful to support your um, child at home. Um, I do wanna talk a little bit about Singapore's sequence because it's, um, this again, I think is one of the pillars of success of their curriculum is that it's very coherent. So your child will never be asked to apply some math that they haven't already mastered. So I, I'll use this um, multiplication sequence as a good example. So in first grade, multiplication is introduced as equal groups. So um, it, for this example here, it's always pictorial or students are building. Um, and so here you can see, you know, we might say there's three trains on one train track, how many trains on four train tracks? Right? So they're building this, exploring that idea of multiplying equal groups. Then in second grade, they're introduced to strategies for multiplying by two, three, four, five, and 10. So here we can see that you know, if students understand two times three and they can visualize that and see that, then four times three is just two groups of two times three. So we're helping them make connections between those simple facts, the twos, the fives, the tens, and help them to use those facts to, to um, derive the threes and the fours. 
Then in third grade, they're introduced to a double digit by single digit multiplication. Okay, so they're using those facts that they've mastered in second grade in order to um, uh, take in and understand this traditional algorithm. So yes, traditional algorithms are introduced, um, but it's um, very sequential and well thought out as to the timing of it. And then in fourth grade, double digit by um, multiplying by a 10. Okay, so here we can see the connection again to place value. If students can multiply 34 times two that they learned in um, third grade, then 34 times 20 is the same as 34 times two tens. So they're using that place value to help them make sense of these calculations as we get into now double digit numbers. And then fifth grade, it's multi-digit by multi-digit multiplication. But everything builds. So multiplication is taught from first grade all the way up through fifth and sixth grade, but it, um, the concepts build on themselves year by year. Um, number sense is a huge part of the curriculum. Um, if you haven't seen one yet, you will be exposed to a number bond at some point in the curriculum. Your child will start drawing these bubbles and you'll think, oh, what do I do with all these bubbles? It's a number bond. Um, basically, it's a part, part, whole representation. So what we want students to understand is that numbers can be composed of parts and numbers can be decomposed into parts. So um, we use this number bond pretty consistently throughout the grades so that students can break apart numbers in different ways, compose numbers in different ways so that they can apply that to deepening their number sense and exploring mental math strategies. So um, here's an example of a number bond where addition is sort of playing out. So we've got four as a part and six as a part. We put those two parts together to get that whole of 10. Um, we can also use a number bond to show subtraction. So if we know that six and four together make 10, if we have a whole of 10 and one of the parts of four, we can subtract to find the other part of six or think four plus what is 10. So it works in both ways. So um, this is one of the things that I think drives parents crazy. It drives a lot of teachers crazy too, is that on the, in the homework, all the problems are written horizontally. And I hear from parents often, they'll say, there's no room for me to write those numbers stacked on top of each other so that we can solve it. So we start here. We start here by deepening their number sense, talking about the numbers, developing mental math strategies that they can use for this so that we can get here. So that once we introduce those traditional algorithms, their number sense is so strong that these algorithms make sense to them and that they can just organize the numbers in that way. So yes, those traditional algorithms are taught, but again, they're taught after that number sense has been developed so that the um, students understand what they're doing when they put that six and eight together, okay? This is also a really good example, this, this problem here is that um, if you had seen this this way first, as most of us who um, have studied math in the United States, we would go straight to just six plus eight, 14, carry the one over into the tens place, right? And add that way. So we would just start following a procedure. But if um, we look at the numbers horizontally like this, what you'll hear in the classroom and um, what I encourage you to also um, ask your child is before you start solving that, tell me about the numbers. You know, that's one quick and easy question to help to, um, deepen your child's number sense. And so they might say, well, 156 is 100, 5 tens, 6 ones, and then 98, 9 tens, and 8 ones, and it's only two away from 100. So knowing that, there are a lot of strategies that students can use that actually end up being easier than that traditional algorithm. So we really do want to focus on developing that number sense first. So mental math equals number sense. So let's talk about some of the mental math strategies. So in first grade, students are introduced to this strategy called making 10. Um, and this making 10 strategy um, is really important because all the other mental math strategies kind of build off of this concept, this idea. So starting off concretely, so those are called 10 frames. If they're filled, there's 10 squares in them. And if it's filled up with red dots or blue dots, it would be 10, right? So, um, you know, nine plus four, we're building that with 
nine um, red dots on one 10 frame, four on the other. And then hopefully what we're, what students are seeing is that, well, gosh, you know what, if I just moved one of those blue ones over, I'd have a complete 10. And so rather than having to think through nine and four, 10, what I've done is I've created 10 plus three, which is 13. Um, and so we work on developing this strategy until, it, until students can recall that basic fact from memory. So they might build it a few times until then they start to see, well, nine and four, okay, in their head, what did we do? We broke apart the four into one and three more. And then we put the nine with the one to make that 10. And so then it's 10 and three. And so abstractly, this might look like this, but eventually we want them doing this in their head, okay? Because adding an even 10 is so much easier than adding 19 or nine or eight or any of those other numbers. We also want to develop their flexibility in thinking. So um, with the problem on the um, previous slide, the numbers were kind of far apart. Seven and eight, sort of close together. Both of them are not too far away from 10. So we want them to get to be flexible. So I could make the seven a 10 by breaking apart the eight, putting the seven and three together. And then this is 10 plus five, which is 15. Or I could complete the eight and make the eight a 10 by getting the two that I need from the seven. So decomposing using that number bond. So this is exactly what's going on here. So when you see your child drawing all these weird lines and things on their paper, this is what they're doing. They're applying that understanding of breaking apart numbers um, from a whole into its parts so that they can then compose them in different ways to make the calculations easier, okay? So developing that flexibility. I could go one way, I could go the other. I don't always have to follow um, a procedure or a series of steps when solving. We want students to generalize their understanding. So making sure they understand what they're doing so that they can then generalize or apply it when the numbers get greater. So here we have 27 plus eight. So 27 is three away from 30 and eight is two away from 10. So we could go either in either direction with flexibility here. But if we were gonna complete the 30 or the 27 and make it 30, we would break apart the eight, put those together and then 35. Um, we could apply that to 127 and 38. Again, we could say 127 only needs three more. We can get it from the 38. So now we've got 130 and 35. Okay, so again, adding those tens is really easy for students. Continuing to generalize, right? So now we've got 542 and 298. So 298, close to 300, right? We could either get the two from the 540, um, two, which would leave us with 540 plus 300. Um, the problem below, 6,542 plus 1,998. Again, that's only two away from 2,000. So we could use that to help us make sense of the problem. And hopefully you're recognizing here that that takes a lot, a lot less effort than going through that traditional algorithm with all that regrouping and renaming. Um, mental math strategies are also applied for multiplication. So in this case, we've got 24 times three. We want students to recognize that 24 can be broken apart into 20 and four. And then 20 times three is 60. We could also think of that as two tens times three, which is six tens. And then four times three, which is 12. And then we just put those two parts together. 60 and 12 is 72. So this is again, developing that conceptual understanding so that when they get to that traditional algorithm, it makes sense as to what they're doing, right? Um, students who have really deep number sense might look at 24 times three and recognize that um, an easier strategy would be to um, over multiply. What if I multiply 25 times three? Because gosh, I'm thinking quarters, that's easy, 75. And then adjusting their answer by taking away a group of three. So what they did was they Instead of finding 24 groups of three, they found 25 groups of three and then took away a group of three, okay? So this is what we want students to be able to do, to be this flexible in their thinking and come up with multiple strategies for solving problems. For division, um, arguably, and if any of you guys out here, uh, here tonight have students who are in third grade or fourth grade, that long division algorithm is the most challenging one that they will face in their elementary career. Um, and so why not teach them a way to make it simpler for them, right? Because the algorithm is really just a way to organize the numbers. And if it doesn't make sense, that's not helpful, right? 
So what we want is for students to look for multiples of four that might be hidden inside 56. So I always encourage students to look for those tens. 10 times four is 40. Is there a 40 in 56? Well, there sure is. And then 16 is what's left. Now the division becomes really easy. We've broken it down into basic facts so that they can divide. 40 divided by four is 10. 16 divided by four is four. 10 and four together, 14. So 56 divided by four is 14. So we want them to be flexible in their thinking and um, to have other strategies to fall back on when those traditional algorithms maybe um, are challenging or um, if they're just memorizing it, it, it might fail them eventually as well. Um, this can carry over into decimal work. So in fourth grade, 20, 28 and four hundredths divided by four, you know, we could teach them to put this into that traditional algorithm to make sure that they slide that decimal point up to the right spot, not to skip the tenths place as they're dividing. Or we can just teach them to break this part. 28 divided by four is seven and four hundredths. And notice I wrote that out in word form. Four hundredths divided by four is one hundredth. So the answer is seven and one hundredth. So I'm hoping by now some of you are thinking, gosh, I wish I learned this in math because when I was first introduced to this, I thought, oh, this makes sense now. Because what I discovered about myself was that I was a really good memorizer. I memorized my way all the way through calculus in high school or in college. Um, but I never really understood why all that, all those procedures worked. And so this just really opened my eyes to that. And I think, you know, this is how math should be taught. Okay. So this is a quote that I just absolutely love. It's from um, doc, Dr. Yip Bon Har. He was one of the um, original authors of that, um, that primary mathematics curriculum that brought Singapore to, that, to the world's attention. Um, and he says, you know, we're not teaching math. What we're teaching is thinking, critical thinking through the medium of math. So when we think of math in the United States, we think calculating, and it's so much more than that. Okay, so Sally, I'm gonna pause here for a second. Were we getting any questions that you want me to address before I move on? Um, we um, have a couple. There's one question, um, Ludwig, I, I um, was curious about um, if Singapore maths like, um, is so successful, why don't more schools adopt it? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> you know, I will tell you that just what I have seen throughout the United States that um, a lot of charter schools and independent schools have adopted a Singapore style curriculum because they don't have to go through the red tape that a school district does. And that's the sad truth of it. <laughs> so why doesn't a big school district adopt it? Because they have to go through all these um, Adopt. So, you know, they have to put groups together, they have to, you know, evaluate the different curriculum and um, there's just a lot of red tape involved. Yeah, and I'll just jump in with respect to um, La Scuola um, being an inquiry school and we have our IB frameworks, we have our transdisciplinary themes and we develop these central ideas. We really, we spent four years, what would be a math curriculum that is open-ended, that is inquiry? And that can pair or run, run with our, our transdisciplinary themes. Often a math program may have inquiries built in and because schools are looking for a pre-made package of an inquiry that's built in. Our students have an inquiry that's across different subject areas. And so for that reason, La Scuola chose this inquiry approach that could partner with uh, the, the big human commonalities of our curriculum framework. Yeah, the other thing that I would add to that too is, you know, there's the, um, the red tape, but then also um, it's hard to teach. It's hard to teach if you didn't learn math this way. So for, again, big school just districts, um, again, sadly, they might not wanna invest the money in training their teachers to be able to teach a curriculum like this. Yeah. Anything else, Sally, before we move on? Not that I haven't been able to answer, but this might be a moment if, yeah, if, if along the way up to this point, if anyone has a question on the content um, that Beth has shared, feel free to unmute and ask. All right. We're gripped. We're so, gripped. 
Good, good. <laughs> okay, so we're going to move into problem solving. Um, bar modeling is something that I think sets um, a Singapore style curriculum apart from other curricula out there. And it's, it's new, it's unfamiliar. Um, when your child brings home problems and says, well, I have to draw a bar for this, or, or I have to draw a bar model, um, it's going to be frustrating. And so what I want to do is kind of walk you through this so that you have some understanding of it so that you can then wrap your head around why we're asking your child to do this and give you some tips on how you can support them. So why bar modeling? Um, it's a great visual model for um, problem solving, for fractions, for ratio, for percentage problems, um, all of those challenging higher level concepts. Um, it helps students come up with a plan. It helps them to determine what calculation they need to do to solve the problem. Um, it starts students off on really thinking and visualizing algebra, which is really truly um, the goal of lower school or elementary mathematics is to prepare students for algebra. And so how great is it for students to be able to go through a program and then to have a visual in their head so that when they get to algebra, it's not just this other crazy way of writing um, equations and solving equations and again, just following procedures, but it actually makes sense. Um, and this is one of the big ones is it provides access to challenging problems. So it provides access to rigor in the curriculum for all students. Okay, so here's your um, bar modeling boot camp. There's basically only two types of bar models. There are part whole bar models. So think that number bond, we've got parts that we put together to make the whole um, and there's comparison. And so we'll get to that in a second. So um, part whole is when you are even give, either given the whole and asked to find some parts or you're given the parts and asked to find the whole, okay? So it's typically side by side. So you'll see like a part and a part we put them together to make the whole. So these are usually represented side by side. Okay, so Sally, you're in the story tonight. <laughs> um, so here's, here's um, how you could help your child walk through um, problem solving with bar modeling. Um, Sally bought some chocolates. So I always encourage students to make sure that they have a good visual in their head. So can you see the chocolates that Sally bought? These are questions you might ask your child. She ate half of them and then gave seven to her best friend. Who is me? No. <laughs> she had five chocolates left. What we're wondering is how many chocolates did Sally buy? So sometimes um, in, to help your child get a good visual in their head, it, it might be helpful to read the problem without the numbers in it. And I know that sounds completely ridiculous, but it helps them to just focus on the situation because the situation is the problem to solve. And then we can put any numbers in here. If you think about that, I could say, in this case, I could say she had 27 chocolates left and she gave four to her friend. It, the numbers don't matter as much as being able to visualize the situation. Okay, so let's talk about concrete materials again. So I mentioned these paper strips earlier. These are my favorite bar model manipulative because they don't cost anything. Um, so Sally bought some chocolates. So this bar is going to represent all the chocolates Sally bought. She ate half of them. Okay, so that's easy, right? We could fold this in half to represent, and I'm just gonna mark this so you guys can see it clearly. Right? So she ate half. And the great thing about using paper strips like this at home um, first, it's fun, makes it a little more fun than drawing them, but um, you can write right on top of them. So I could write here, um, eight. Okay. Um, now, what we know is that the, she then gave seven chocolates to her friend and she had five left. So if she ate these, that can't be the seven and the five, the seven and the five has to be over here. So then we can mark that off. And you can write labels like gave and the five left. So now we can clearly see that if this half is seven plus five or 12, then two groups of 12 would be 24 chocolates. So Sally bought 24 chocolates, okay? Once students can um, build it with a concrete model, then what we want them to start doing is drawing it. Now, something I wanna tell you that I, is super powerful if your child says, my teacher says I have to draw a bar and I'm so frustrated, I don't know what to do. What I always say is just draw a rectangle on your paper. 
And I'll say that to students in the classroom, just draw something, draw a rectangle on the paper. Once they get something down on the paper, it's gotten them over that hump. And so then all you have to do is say, okay, well, what do you want that, that bar to be? Do you want it to be all the chocolates? Do you want it to be the half that she ate? It doesn't matter at that point. If it's the half, we just add another half. If that's all the chocolates, then we label it as such and then we start marking it up. So just getting them to put something on the paper and then relate it back to the story. What do we want that to represent? Okay, so in this case, I'm gonna have it represent all the chocolates. I know she ate half, so we're gonna draw that and mark that. She gave seven away and she had five left. And what we're looking for is the total. So I do encourage students to label their bar models as best as possible because they can use this to help them determine the um, operation or the, the equation they need to use to solve it. They can also use it to check their answer for reasonableness. So once they get the answer, if they imagine that 24 is up here on top, does that make sense? Yeah, looking at the numbers, it does. If I came up with a number that was less than seven, then a red flag should go off in my head because it's not possible because I've got seven. Seven is one of the parts there. So it, so we can use the bar model to also help us check our answers for reasonableness. And then there's the comparison models. So this, these are the types of problems that have more than, less than, fewer, greater, taller, shorter, anytime we're comparing two or more objects. So the difference between, a, so your part, part, whole goes this way, we're putting them together. When we're comparing, we're stacking them on top of each other, okay? So um, it's when we're comparing two or more quantities and something that's important is that, you know, this is the difference right here up to this point, it's exactly the same. And so that's a big concept for kids is that whatever's off, off on that um, left-hand side, those two pieces have the same exact value. The difference is how much more, how much less, how much taller, how much shorter. Okay. So here's a, um, Multiplication comparison problem. Julia has three times as much money as Alex. They have $48 altogether. How much money does Julia have? So this is where post-it notes are super fun to work with because we're talking about equal sized units. When we're multiplying, it's, an, it's we're multiplying equal groups. So equal sized units, these would be great to use. Um, I'll go ahead and use these linking cubes. Um, we tend to have a lot of these in the classroom. Um, you may have something like this at home too. Okay, so Julia has three times as much as Alex. So if I built this like this, then you know what I would ask is, does that look like three times as much? Yeah, because right here it's one time, right? Two times as much, three times as much. So this looks like three times as much. Then what we would do is we would label this. We could label it, we could put this on a piece of paper, lay it down and then start labeling. Again, with those post-it notes, just like with the paper strips, you can write right on top of them, which is really handy. Okay, so we've got that visual. Julia has three, three times as much money as Alex. What we know is they have 48 all together. So this bracket on the side represents your all together. It's everything that's within that bracket. It's the sum of everything within that bracket. What we're wondering is how much money does Julia have? So we'll put the question mark up there. So now what we can see is that we have four equal sized units. And the thing with bar modeling is the size of the unit, um, it matters because um, the units have size, they have the same value. So if they are drawn with the same size, then they have the same value. So here we have four units that are equal sized. So then each of those units has the same value. So then we can say that um, four units is 48. So then one unit is 48 divided by four or 12. Okay, a lot of students will stop there and say 12 is the answer, but this is where having that question mark is going to come in handy because if you look back and you see where the question mark is, well, wait a second. No, the 12 is actually what Alex um, had. What we're wondering though is what Julia had. So then we have to do one more step. Three units is 12 times three or 36. Okay, and hopefully you're seeing some algebraic thinking right in here, right? I could have written this as 4x equals 48. So we're starting them really young, seeing and developing that visual for algebra. So Julia has $36. Okay, this is one of my favorite problems. So what we want is for students to develop a firm understanding of bar modeling for um, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, fractions, 
so that when the concepts get harder, they understand how to use the tool in order to access these um, higher level concepts. So like ratio, right? Some of you are probably cringing now when I say ratio, but a ratio is a comparative, it's a comparison bar model. Um, it's a comparison and it's equal sized units. So we're taking all of those pieces and now we're putting them together. So the sides of a triangle are in the ratio of three to five to seven. If the perimeter of the triangle is 90 centimeters, find the length of the shortest side. So if the sides are in a ratio of three to five to seven, all of the sides are different lengths. So we can see that. So again, we want students to be able to visualize this. So now we're gonna represent this with equal units. So we're gonna represent one, one side with three, one side with five and one side with seven units. Now, what we're looking for is the length of the shortest side. We know all together um, that the perimeter. So if we add all of that together, it's gonna be 90 centimeters, okay? So now what we have are a whole bunch of units that have a value of 90. So it's the same, con it's the same idea. So we're using that same sort of strategy to solve this. So what we can see is that we have 15 units that are 90. So then one unit is 90 divided by 15 or six. But again, we have to go back and look at the question mark, which is over top of three units. So six times three is 18. So um, the length of the shortest side then is 18 centimeters. So we want students to get to the point where they can just solve problems like this or by using abstract um, calculations. But again, remember that um, bar modeling is a tool to give access to these higher level problems for students. So if a student forgets you know, what ratio means, they could draw it out if they have that visual. And that's, that's what we want for our, our students, okay? Because we want them to get to a point where they can access problems like this, okay? I have had um, parents before say that there are problems like this on um, the LSATs that they had to take to get into law school. So um, this is a challenging problem, but I would, I would say that a end of year third grader, beginning of year fourth grader, who has really got a firm grasp of using that bar modeling tool could draw a picture of this easily and solve it, okay? Madison started saving some money on Monday. On each day from Tuesday to Friday, she saved $2 more than the amount she saved the day before. She saved a total of $60 from Monday to Friday. We're wondering how much she saved on Monday, okay? So we know that she saved some money from Monday to Friday, right? But we don't know how much that is. So we can start by just showing these, um, by showing Monday with an equal sized unit. Okay, let me back up a bit. Now, what we know is that each day from Tuesday to Friday, she saved the same as she had the day before plus an extra $2. So on Tuesday, she saved the same as she did on Monday plus an extra $2. Now, at this point, I don't know the values of those units, but that's not the important part. The important part is, um, can I visualize this so that I can come up with the equations to solve it? On Wednesday, same as on Tuesday, plus $2. Notice my $2 units are the same size because they're always $2. Thursday, same as on Wednesday, plus $2. And Friday, same as on Thursday, plus $2. And all of that has a value of $60. So now we know that those little blue boxes have a value of two, and I can see that there are 10 of those. So that would be $2 times 10 um, or a total of $20, right? So if we take that out of our problem, so we're just gonna say 60 minus 20 is 40. We're removing it from our bar model. Now we have four equal sized units that are, sorry, five equal sized units that have a value of 40. So then we can divide 40 by five to get $8 and conclude that she saved $8 on Monday. Okay. So this is where we want our students to be able to go, to get to, to reach this point where they um, can use this tool to help them solve more challenging, maybe unfamiliar problems. Okay, any questions for bar modeling? List. I don't see any in the chat, Beth. Okay, good. So how you, how you can help at home, right? Be excited about math. Math might not have been your favorite subject in school and it might have even caused you a whole lot of anxiety. And maybe even now today saying, 
math to you or letting you know that you're, you might need to help your child with math is making you feel anxious. What I would um, love for you to do is just try to put that aside and be excited about math, excited about how your child is learning math and how it might be different and, and engage in that learning process along with them. So be super supportive. Um, it is so absolutely tempting when your child comes home and is frustrated and doesn't understand the Singapore method for solving something or working through something. It is so um, tempting to just say, um, you know what? Let's put that aside. Let me show you how I learned it, right? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but sometimes children will hear, mm, I don't need to pay attention to the teacher. My mom knows a better way, right? And so we don't want to create that. So what I would ask is that you be as supportive as you can. And if your child comes home and says, I don't get these number bonds or I don't know how to do this bar modeling, it's okay to say, you know what, I don't know it either because I didn't learn math this way, but I'm so excited that you're learning this great way. You know, you're going to understand math at such a deeper level than I ever did. Will you please go back to school tomorrow and ask your teacher to explain it to you again and then come home and show me? That's a more supportive approach than just kind of saying, eh, let's just dismiss that and I'll show you a different way of doing it. Okay. Um, if you um, want to show your child the way that you learned math, that's great. Just see if you can explain it using place value. Okay. Um, you can also help just with basic fact fluency. So these are kind of some benchmarks that your the students will go through as they progress through the grades. So in kindergarten, if you have a kindergartner right now, play with numbers, count objects, put numbers together, take numbers apart, talk about numbers and where you see them in your, in your life. Um, if you have a first grader who is not yet fluent with adding and subtracting within 10, that's where you can help. They will be introduced to probably in the spring, um, adding and subtracting within 20. And so you can start working on that. So if you have a second grader who is not fluent in those basic facts of adding and subtracting within 20, you can help them support, support them there, okay? Um, the curriculum does introduce multiplication in second grade. So if you have a third grader, um, you can help them with the facts for two, three, four, five, and 10. And then by the end of third grade, they will have been exposed to strategies for all the facts. So if you have a fourth grader, you can practice everything in this list. So you'll practice all the multiplication and division facts, the addition and subtraction facts, and help them to get that to fluency. Now, notice I'm saying um, develop that understanding to fluency. So um, there's a lot out there right now about memorization and how you know we're damaging children by asking them to memorize things. So with the Singapore style curriculum, the focus is always on teaching a strategy first. And then we allow students to apply the strategy until they can recall the fact from memory. Some people maybe, you know, just struggle with memorization and they might not ever um, be able to recall them from memory, but at least then they have the strategy to fall back on. So that's kind of the Singapore um, philosophy with um, basic facts and memorization and everything. Um, you can also help by making that fluency practice fun. So there, this is a site that I just, um, I love because um, you can click on your child's grade level within the site, it's called Math Playground. Um, and the games are pretty appropriate for practicing concepts that are grade level um, appropriate. For, for um, problem solving and bar modeling practice within Math Playground, there's um, something called Thinking Blocks. Sorry, this got broken up like that, but it's thinking blocks. Again, all of this is in the um, handout that I um, gave to Sally that she forwarded to you guys. Um, and so thinking blocks is a great way if you would like to learn more about bar modeling or if your child um, seems to need some extra practice, you can help them with that. And then just playing games. Games are fun, you know, grab some cards, have some dice around the house and play some games. So this is one of my um, favorite, favorite games to play. It does require three players. Oop. Oh, hang on. Whoop. Oh, what did I do? <laughs> Hold on. Let me go back to the, let me stop my share for a second because I want to make sure you guys can hear this. Technology, right? Uh, here we are.
Okay, so this is a game of salute. Um, if I was with you, Sally can attest to that, I would ask you guys to come up and we would play this game. So this is my alternative to this. this is, these are my COVID friends. <laughs> and so um, they're gonna explain the game of salute. <laughs> This is the game of salute. Can you hear it's this? It's a great game for practicing basic fact fluency in addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. To play the game of salute, the materials you need are a deck of cards. These UNO cards are great, just take the skip and reverse cards out. You could also play with a regular deck of playing cards, just take the face cards out. Or if you happen to have a set of number cards in the classroom, you could use those as well. So you also need three players, player one, player two, and then the dealer. So to play addition and subtraction version of this game, on the first round, the dealer's going to deal each player a card. And then when the dealer says salute, each player flips a card away from them so they can't see it and they place it on their forehead. Now player two can see player one's card and player one can see player two's card, but they don't know the card that's on their own head. Then the dealer is going to say, the sum of your two cards is nine. And then the player who can identify the number on their own forehead first wins the round. So if player two says four, before player one says five, player two wins the round. And then the cards can go back in the pile for the dealer, just back in the bottom. And then every, on, at the end of every round, players could rotate positions. So player two would move into the dealer's position the dealer would go into player one's position and player one would move into player two. That way everybody gets their practice with addition and subtraction. So when um, the players have the card on their forehead, they're practicing subtraction because they can see, they hear the sum or the total and they can see the card on their, which is the part which is on the other person's head. Um, and the dealer is always practicing the addition piece. Now to play this game to practice fact fluency of multiplication and division facts, games set up the same way. The dealer would deal a card to each player. When the dealer says salute, those cards are flipped to the forehead. Except this time, the dealer says, the product of your two cards is 63. And then the first player to identify their own number again would win. So that's the game of salute, a great game to practice basic fact fluency in your classroom. Or at home. <laughs> okay, so playing games is fun. Um, it's much more fun than just fla flashing through flashcards. Okay, so I do encourage that. All right, questions. That kind of concludes my presentation. So I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Yes, um, Beth, I'm looking in chat, so I'll, I'll read out um, a sure. couple. And then, um, of course, um, everyone can um, unmute and um, we can go, go at it. So a question came through that said, um, how can I best support a child who is especially interested in math and is operating one to two levels above grade level? Mm -hmm. Um, how I just, it just bumped down. So I think generally, um, speaking, yeah. and then if I, I see the other part, I will find it in the chat. Yeah. So, um, there are a lot of resources out there, um, for extension activities for students and what I can do, um, you know, I, I pretty sure that the teachers at La Scuola have this list, but I will go ahead and make sure that Sally has it again to get, um, out to you guys. But um, there are a few of my favorite sites that will um, give, mostly I recommend logic-based sort of um, games or puzzles that students can play. So those students that are functioning at that higher level and who enjoy math, they're going to love those logic-based games and um, trying to solve problems in that way. There are some resources um, that are directly tied with the Singapore curriculum that are called um, challenging word problems. Those are wonderful and they are truly challenging. So if your child is interested in that too, um, I would also encourage you to um, think about um, programs involving coding, um, get them interested in you know some, some coding with computers and applying that mathematical knowledge to um, creating, um, you know, websites and web pages and things like that and um, programs. So definitely along that, those lines, that's what I would encourage you to do. Yeah. Yeah. 
And also the second part of the question is how does La Scuola um, support students with this, um, you know, in accelerated math? And to Beth's point, we do have uh, extensions of uh, the grade level Singapore math um, programs. We're always looking ahead into the next grade, grade partnering with teachers in the next grade, and as well as, you know, supporting students um, that, who have the emerging uh, skills. There's um, intensive practice, um, we'll have extra practice, and again, the challenging word problems. We also move into, you know, more conceptual. How do we transfer mm -hmm. that knowledge you know, to the point that Beth was saying? We're going to have non-routine situations. And so as an educator, um, we will think, where is the child and where can we stretch them? Um, so we're big fans of stretching um, and um, working with uh, supporting uh, students as well. Um, you know, the whole, the whole, um, the whole continuum. Um, yeah. We had explored a little bit of accelerating into another classroom with COVID. It was um, in, in, impossible, but uh, we're really open to conversations with parents, um, you know, on a need be basis. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would um, just add to that too, that um, the reason that Singapore is so successful is because they teach with such great depth. So, um, you know, your child grasps a concept quickly rather than moving them on the, the Singapore approach would be to take them deeper within that concept. So, so really to, you know, get them solving those unfamiliar multi-step um, really complex word problems around that concept. And so um, the Singapore idea, as far as working with um, higher level students is to enrich. So to really go deeper rather than to accelerate. So we really want to make sure that those students get that real deep, deep understanding so that they can apply that in those unfamiliar situations like Sally was talking about. <laughs> yep. All right. Anything else here? Anybody want to unmute and just ask a question? I'm happy to answer. See, there's a question here about, let's see, this chat box is hard to, <laughs> Sally, you having a problem with this too. The little, the little cursor moves around an awful lot. Um, there was a question about. Um, I, can, um, I can speak really okay. briefly to um, that bridge between um, the elementary. So we have their child is, you know, kindergarten through fifth in the Singapore math program. We're learning all these concepts. We have the the um, concrete, pictorial, and abstract. Moving into the MYP program where it's the single subject math and they work interdisciplinary. Um, the MYP program is slightly different in the math, um, but what um, Neelam Ankanduri, our middle school um, math and science expert, um, is saying that the students coming in from our elementary program, um, they really, um, embrace all aspects of the middle school math. So they're able beyond the pencil and paper, pen and pe uh, pencil and paper, they can investigate, they can find the patterns, they can generalize to what Beth was speaking about, communicating about their thinking. And they also um, are able to confidently um, address real world issues through their math thinking. Um, so I just thought I'd take that opportunity to, to express that foundation, strong foundation of critical thinking through math medium. Okay. Great. Well, many thanks to everyone. And um, again, thank you, Beth, for for sharing your your knowledge and um, you know a, a, a great view into La Scuola's um, program elementary program and then um, yeah it's just wonderful so anything else Amanda did you want to ask about um, long division any I know that's a important topic. 
Beth, we are just, um, a question came up um, around long division and you kind of touched mm -hmm. on it um, um, uh, briefly that there is that algorithm that we eventually, and it's one of the hardest um, algorithms that, you know, in the elementary that will, a student will uh, take on. And you wanted to emphasize all the knowledge that, um, and reasoning that happens before tackling one of those, mm -hmm. um, the long division. Um, did you want to speak a little bit more around um, do you have anything else to share about that long division? Well, all the traditional algorithms, um, something to keep in mind is that the way that we learned them here in the United States is, is specific to the United States. It's just a way of organizing the numbers. So those algorithms were created to help uh, mathematicians before we had calculators, believe it or not. <laughs> so um, it was to help them to be able to calculate these big numbers before we had calculators. Um, and so it's just a way of organizing numbers. So really what's important is not the steps in an algorithm, but the understanding that goes with it. So, and, and again, that's what the emphasis is going to be in the classroom is more on the number sense around those operations rather than the procedure, you know, following steps in a procedure. So. With that, I'd love to um, wish everyone a wonderful rest of your evening. Again, thank you for taking the time to, for joining us. To join yes, us. thank you so much. I'll stick around for a bit if anyone has an individual question they want to ask. I know at this point we'd be going back and having a little more cheese and a know, right? <laughs> <laughs> lining up to chat with you, Beth. <laughs> Next year. <laughs> it's great to see everyone, Sonia and Daria. And... All right, anyone still hanging around for a question or if not, you um, feel free to just check out. And we'll, hang, we'll hang out here for a few more minutes. Let's see, we have Wolf and Andrea, Jason and Minerva, Marisa. Thank you for being here. Maybe they've already stepped away. <laughs> Let's see. Just give up maybe another minute and then I can. Hi, Wolf. Hi, Andrea. There we go. Yeah, that's a little easier. Let's see. End the recording.